Good morning. <laughs> good to see all of you here today. Uh, it is good to be gathered together as the family of God, the body of Christ, um, and uh, just excited to worship the Lord together. Um, it is it is vacation season, and so we got folks going all over the place and in and out, and uh, and so we are. Um, making do with some of our substitutes this morning. I'm very grateful for those who are standing in and helping out in uh, different ways. Um, It is good. It's just good to be gathered as God's people, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, to worship Him. He is worthy of glory. He's worthy of worship. He is such a good God. He's holy and just in all His ways, but He has loved us so much that He has sent His one and only Son to rescue us from our sin. And I hope that you are grateful for that today. I hope that you have trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation. If you hadn't done that, you need to. You need to trust in Christ. He's the only one that can save. He's the only way that we can be rescued from our sin. And I hope that today, as we spend some time in God's Word, through the preaching of His Word, as we join our voices together in song, um, I I hope and pray that the Lord would speak to your heart and that we would exalt Jesus Christ here in this place today. You've got your uh, announcements and your worship guide there. Make sure you take a look at those. Uh, We are doing uh, sign-ups for Vacation Bible School volunteers, and we need lots of volunteers to help. Um, There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Make sure you check that out. Um, It's it's divided up on different areas that you can serve, so you can look and uh, and decide what uh, area you'd like to serve in. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can see uh, Amanda or Megan, and they'll be glad to um, answer those questions. You can see me, and I'll do my best to answer those questions as well. But uh, that's, that's one of our big things coming up, and uh, it's just around the corner. And so uh, if you can help out with that, um, that, would be, uh, that would be great. There's other announcements in your worship guide. Make sure you take a look at those um, and see the things that we have going on. I would ask that you pray for me this week. Um, I'll be traveling today to Anaheim uh, for the um, annual meeting of our Southern Baptist Convention, and um, and so uh, I'm going to be leaving very quickly after the service is over, so I don't mean to be rude to anyone, uh, but I do have to, to get on the road quickly today, and, um, and so I just ask that you would pray for me and pray for um, our convention as we meet this week, that God will be honored and glorified through all that is said and done. If you're a guest with us today, we're glad that you have chosen to join us in worship. If you need something, ask somebody around you. We'll be more than happy to serve you in any way that we can. We are here today, church, to worship our great God. We're going to go to Psalm chapter 30 and let God's word call us to worship him. And uh, so I'm going to invite Samantha uh, to join me. And uh, we're going to read through Psalm chapter 30. And let's let God's word lead us to give him the glory and the praise that he's worthy of. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored, to my, you restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid my face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that the glory may sing your praises and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here in this place today. Lord, thank you so much for your word, which draws our hearts to you and to your holiness, and yet also to your faithfulness, your graciousness, your mercy towards us. Lord, we cry out with the psalmist, be our helper, Lord. Be our helper. We need your help. Lord, we need your help to be rescued from our sin. And you have helped us by sending Jesus Christ. You have done all the work that is necessary for us to be saved from our sin through the death and resurrection of your son. But God, even as people who have trusted in Christ, we still need your help. Lord, we are not perfect. We fail in many ways. But Lord, we want to honor you. We want to serve you with our lives. And so we ask that you would help us do that. Lord, even as we've gathered here today, Lord, we ask that you would help us 
give you the glory and the honor and the praise that you are worthy of. Lord, may the, the, the songs that we sing, the, the word as, as it is preached, Lord, the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, as the psalmist says, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God. Father, we, we are grateful that you care for us in every season of life. Lord, and I, I, I'm not you. I don't know what everyone in this room has brought into this place today, but Lord, you do. You know our hearts. You know us inside and out. You know us better than we know ourselves. And so you know what, what everyone has brought into this place today. You know the, the joys of this past week. You know the, the burdens and the trials of this past week. You, Lord, you know the things that are weighing heavy on us as we look into the week that is ahead. But Father, would you minister to our hearts and souls? Lord, ultimately for your glory but also for our good. God, would you encourage us today? Would you strengthen us as your people? Would you help us learn to serve you and follow you and love you better and better and better? God, because Jesus is worthy of it. God, because the one who has laid down his life is worthy of our lives. The one who has given us life, life everlasting, is worthy of every breath that we have. And so, Father, as we gather here today, Lord, would you be honored in every breath that we breathe, in every song that we sing, Lord, as we pay careful attention to your word and seek to apply it to our lives, Lord, would Christ be exalted? That is our prayer, and we need your help to do that. So would you help us, Father? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to lift our voices in song.
church family, one of, the, one of the many great things about our God is His ability to write the story of this world. When you, when you open your Bible and you read, one of the things I'm just continually blown away with is how God just he is over every detail and He's weaving all the things of life into His plan. We read this across the pages of Scripture, and then we see that and know that's happening even in our lives today. So as we sing this next song, Christ the True and Better, we sing about these stories from God's Word. Let's see it from God's perspective, how He is pointing everything to Christ. And I hope today that He's pointing us to Jesus as well. I know He is, if, he's, if we're willing to let Him point us to Christ. So let's sing this song, Amazed at How Great Our God Is, and the story that He has been writing and is continuing to write.
Church family, I invite you to open up in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 33 is our text for today. What a beautiful gift God has given us in His Word, revealing Himself to us in such a great, timeless, completely true, and relevant for our lives way. And so thankful for His Word. The title of our message today is The Blessed Life, Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 33. I'm going to read from God's word. You follow along. Let's enjoy hearing from God. Genesis 26. Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister, for he feared to say my wife, thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I thought, lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, what is this that you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that also. So he called its name Sitna. 
And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And Isaac's servants dug a well. When Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we, as we have not touched you and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths, and Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug, and said to him, We have found water. He called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. This is the word of the Lord for his church today. Heavenly Father, would you help us understand your word, understand what you have said and are saying to us today. And Lord, help us to have sensitive spirits to your spirit as your spirit works in our lives and presses your truth upon our hearts. And Father, may we respond in obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We write about it. We read books about it. We wear it on t-shirts. We hope in it. We strive for it. And we envy those who appear to have it. What am I talking about? The blessed life. The blessed life. Now, I hope that you want to live a blessed life. I want to live a blessed life. But, Church, we need to make sure we understand what the blessed life actually is according to God. Now, God's Word tells us a lot about the blessed life. But we want to see what chapter 26 of Genesis teaches us about the blessed life. The blessed life assumes that there is someone being blessed, but it also assumes that there is someone doing the blessing. And that someone doing the blessing is none other than God. We want to be blessed, and we rightly want to to be blessed by God. We want God to be the one who is doing the blessing. But we have a problem. We have a problem. And the problem with us, it's not a problem with God, it's our problem. The problem with us is that we often want God to do the blessing, but we want to define what the blessing looks like. And you probably know that if you're honest. I'm trying to be honest before you today. I know that's true in my life. And if you're honest, you know that's probably been true at some point in your life. We want God to bless us, but we want to define what that blessing looks like. But the truth is that God gets to define what the blessed life looks like, not us. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. The good news is that God's definition of the blessed life is far better than anything you or I would ever come up with on our own. And so as we study Genesis 26, 1 through 33, we learn that, church, God graciously allows sinners to experience divine blessing. God graciously allows sinners to experience divine blessing. Blessing. The word blessed, I hope you noticed it as we read through chapter 26, the word blessed is repeated multiple times in this passage as God focuses in on Isaac as the next in line to carry on God's promises of salvation and promises of deliverance and promises of hope for the world. And we're going to look at some of the specifics of how God defines the blessed life. But before we get to the specifics, we need to just stop and enjoy for a moment with humble hearts the truth that God graciously allows sinners to experience His blessing, to experience blessing coming from Him. Chapter 26 is really the only chapter in the Bible that focuses pretty much completely on Isaac. There's other chapters that deal with Isaac um, somewhat, but, uh, but this is really the only chapter where really all the focus, as far as on a human person, um, on, on someone here on this earth, where all the focus is on God. Excuse me, on Isaac. I'm sorry, on Isaac. 
And what we see is that Isaac is not perfect. Isaac is not a perfect man. In fact, he repeated one of the same sins that we saw his father commit multiple times as we studied about the life of Abraham in the previous chapters. And yet, five times in this passage, we are told that Isaac was blessed by the Lord. I hope just that simple truth will encourage you and will encourage me today as we humbly confess our sin, our failures before God, and yet at the same time rest in His grace towards us, rest in His gracious willingness to still bless us in spite of ourselves. And ultimately, I hope and pray that it would lead us to worship God for the way that He blesses us. Let's also take just a minute and consider the context of this passage. Now, chapter 25, the previous chapter, we learned that uh, Abraham, Isaac's uh, father, died, and Isaac has married um, this lady named Rebecca, and in chapter 25, we learned that they had twin boys. Remember their names, uh, Jacob and Esau. We'll start with Esau. He came first, right? Esau and Jacob. Um, But we also saw that uh, he's kind of taken Esau's place as the firstborn. Now, Jacob is going to be the main character for several chapters in Genesis. We're going to talk a lot about Jacob in the coming uh, coming weeks. But chapter 26 actually kind of takes us back in time a little bit. It takes us back to the 20-year period between Isaac and Rebekah getting married and then their twins being born. Remember this 20-year period where they were trying to have children and they they didn't. Uh, Rebekah was barren. And so... Chapter 26 uh, happens in that time. So Jacob and Esau aren't, don't, don't appear to be here on, on this earth yet. Um, and so we get a little bit of information about what's going on here. We have famine. We have them moving around. Uh, lots of wells being dug. And, um, and so that's kind of the gist. That's kind of the context of chapter 26. But what gets highlighted in this chapter is that God passed the promised blessing from Abraham to Isaac, even though Isaac was not perfect, even though he didn't deserve it. I want to share with you, church family, uh, four truths this morning regarding the blessed life as we take a look at God's blessing being passed on to Isaac. The truth number one, church, is this. God's blessing leads us to walk in faith or walk by faith in God's promises. God's blessing leads us to walk by faith in God's promises. We're, We're thinking, what does the blessed life look like? Well, one of the things we clearly see in this passage is that it is a life of faith. That means a life of not always knowing what's around the corner, but having to trust God and trust his word, his promises. Verse 1 begins by telling us that there was a famine in the land. Now, Abraham had faced a famine, and now Isaac is facing a famine. Now, what do you do when there's a famine in the land? What do you do? You go looking for food, right? I mean, that's what you got to do. You got to live. You got to survive. You go looking for food. Maybe you move to another place. You, you try to look for a better place to live. And verse 1 goes on to tell us that Isaac left in light of the famine. He left and he went to Gerar, which was the land of the Philistines. But, but verse 2 reveals that Isaac probably had his sights set a little bit further south. He probably had his sights set not on Gerar and the land of the Philistines, but on Egypt. Well, how do we know that? Well, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said to him, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Now, why would Isaac have perhaps wanted to go to Egypt? Well, Egypt was a place that looked very appealing from the outside. For one thing, it was a decent, decent um, uh, a distance away from his land where the famine was. Let's, let's get away from the land where the famine is. Egypt looked like a place that, hey, we can, we can live. We can escape the hardship that we're facing. We can live the blessed life if we go to Egypt. Egypt held out the promise of food and security and safety and a better life, the blessed life. But God said no. Very clearly said no. Don't go down to Egypt. What is God wanting Isaac to do? He's wanting Isaac to walk by faith. He said, dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because it is. That's exactly what God had told Isaac's father, Abraham, all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. 
Go and live in the land that I will show you. And so just like with Abraham, God is calling Isaac to walk by faith. Egypt looked, looked like the place of blessing. But God said, no, trust me. Trust my word. Trust my promises. And what were God's promises? Well, they're beautiful. Genesis uh, chapter 26, verse 3 through 5. Sojourn in this land, God tells Isaac, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham, that's Isaac's father, obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. And so hopefully those promises sound very familiar to you if you've been uh, paying attention and following along as we've been walking through the book of Genesis. God makes the same promises that he made to, to Isaac that he made to Isaac's father, Abraham. The promise of blessing, land, and offspring through which all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's the promise. And that's what Isaac is being called to fix his eyes upon. He is to fix his gaze not upon the visible food and security that Egypt promises, but on the invisible but very real promises of God. It's a life of faith. What is is Isaac going to do? He's being called to this blessed life where he has to trust God with his future, but he's got a choice to make. What is he going to do? Look at verse 6. So Isaac went to Egypt? No. Isaac settled in Gerar. He chose to trust the promises of God. Church, we are tempted to think that the blessed life means doing what seems right in our own eyes. We are tempted to think that the blessed life means solving the problems that face us in a way that just makes sense to us on surface level. But we have a God who sees far beyond the present. He knows what is best for us. And what we learn here is that the the, the blessed life is not acting on our own intuitions, but trusting the Lord, walking by faith, which means we take our directives from God and we trust our future to Him, even if other ways or other plans seem to make more sense in our minds. I mean, it seems like you would want to get as far from the famine as you could if you wanted to live, but God says no. The allure of the security of Egypt is always before us. But the blessed life is the one which trusts God to set the course. Church, walking by faith is not easy. God doesn't sugarcoat over the life of faith. It's not always easy. It's hard to trust what we can't see. But God's promises are good. They are always good, and they're true, and they're worth trusting in God and his word in order to attain. Truth number two. Truth number one, God's blessing leads us to walk by faith in God's promises. Truth number two, God's blessing is an act of grace. God's blessing is an act of his grace. So God tells Isaac to stay in Gerar. Isaac steps out in faith obeys God's command, even though Egypt probably looked good. But then we learn in verses 7 through 11 that Isaac's faith was a faulty faith. And you you and I know what that looks like. Because if you have faith in the Lord, if you have faith in Jesus, let 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 me fill you in on something if you weren't aware of this. Your faith is faulty. Let me fill you in on this, and just in case you weren't aware of this, my faith is faulty. My faith is very faulty. Isaac's faith was not a perfect faith. It was a faulty faith. He trusted God to provide food for he and Rebekah and Gerar. He trusted God's word, and he stayed there, but he didn't trust God to protect him from the men of Gerar. He feared that when they learned that Rebekah was his wife, they would kill him so they could have her. And instead of turning that fear over to God and letting him handle it, Isaac lied about Rebekah. He said, she's my sister. 
Now we learn in chapter 24 that he is related to Rebecca. They, it's his second cousin, depending on how you count cousins. But he wasn't his sister. And so Isaac is lying. Isaac is lying. And if this story sounds familiar, it's because Isaac's father, Abraham, you remember, did the exact same thing. In chapter 12, Abraham told Pharaoh, Abraham had gone to Egypt. He told Pharaoh and the Egyptians that Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. And then in chapter 20 of Genesis, Abraham tells Abimelech, that name sounds familiar, right? That Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. Multiple times, Abraham commits this same sin, lying about who his wife actually is. Now, I'll kind of pause for a second in case you're wondering is this Abimelech the same Abimelech from chapter 20? Is, is Isaac talking to the same guy that his father Abra, uh, Abraham had talked to and lied to? Probably not. It's been a good many years that passed. You say, well, they have the same name. Well, people can have the same name. But also, it could be that Abimelech was more of a title for the king, for the lo- leader. Just like the title Pharaoh gets passed, or passed around, right? Pharaoh this, Pharaoh that, Pharaoh this, Pharaoh that. Lots of Pharaohs. There could have been a lot of Abimelechs. Um, it could have been more of a title for the king. So probably not the same one, but this is the same area. And so this Abimelech probably knew what Abraham had done to perhaps his father or whoever he had succeeded in, um, in this line of succession to the throne here in Gerar. Now, again, this passage is doing something for the storyline of Scripture. It's connecting Isaac to his father Abraham. So in the last section we looked at, the first section of Genesis 26, we saw the connection between the promises. Same promises given to Abraham are given to Isaac. But now we see another connection. But it's not that great of a connection because they're also connected in their sin. Apparently, Abraham passed down his sin to Isaac. Isaac repeated the same sin of his father. They were connected by faith, but they were also connected by faulty faith. Verse 8 tells us that Abimelech saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah. That word laughing, remember, is actually what Isaac's name means. It means he laughs. And, and here, laughing is used most likely as a euphemism for Isaac flirting with and being physically romantic with his wife toward Rebecca. And so Abimelech sees this. He's been thinking all along, oh, this is not Isaac's wife. And then Abimelech goes, whoa, wait a second. They must be married. Wait a second. That means Isaac has been lying to me and to our people this whole time. And so what does he do? He confronts Isaac. He calls him out for his lying. Abimelech knows that he and his people would have been guilty if one of them had taken another man's wife. Isaac's sin almost led other people into sin. And so Abimelech was rightfully upset. But here's the amazing thing. God still blesses Isaac. God still blesses Isaac. It doesn't mean that God could care less about sin. It's not what that means. The Isaac still being blessed in spite of his sin doesn't mean that God just, ah, whatever, you can sin, I don't really care if you're lying or whatever, and putting other people in danger of, of sinning as well, ah, it doesn't matter to me. No, that's not, that's not the explanation here. What does it mean that Isaac still gets blessed even though his faith is not perfect? Well, it means that God is a God of grace. It means that God is a God of grace. God's blessing is an act of his grace. His blessing to Isaac was not something that Isaac had earned by his good works. It was an undeserved gift. It was an act of grace. That's what the word grace means, to receive something that you don't deserve. This gift. And the same is true, church, when we receive God's blessing. We, we never experience the blessed life because we have earned it. That's never the explanation of us receiving God's blessing. The explanation is never, I have done something good and I have earned it. It's always because God has shown us grace. Our faith is faulty just like Isaac's. He thought they would kill him even though God had told him, you're going to live in this land, you're going to have offspring. I mean, that's basically a promise that you're not going to die. And yet, uh, Isaac didn't trust that. His faith was faulty. And yet, God still chose to bless him. You know, sometimes... Uh, people will look at someone, I don't know if you've ever said this or heard someone say this, I know I, know I have before, but, but some, somebody will look at someone who has what they want or seems to be experiencing the blessed life and say, oh, he must be living right. Oh, she must be living right. 
Or, or maybe we say, oh, I must not be living right. <laughs> As we look at what they have and we want it and we don't, we, I must not be living right. He must be living right. She must be living right. Now, the principle that you reap what you sow is a true principle, is a biblical principle, but the blessed life is not something ultimately that you earn. It is something God gives. At the end of the day, if we are experiencing God's blessing, we can never take credit for it. We can never then turn that around and say, well, I must be living right. What are we doing at that point? We're, 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 We're focusing attention on us. We're saying, I'm worthy of this blessed life that God has given me. No, you're not. No, I am not. It is a gift of grace from beginning to end. We must never think we earn it, earned it. We didn't. We're sinners just like Isaac. And just like Isaac, we need God to act in grace toward us. And praise God, church, he has done so. He has done so through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We did not earn Jesus coming to save us. God graciously sent his son to save us in spite of our rebellion and for our rebellion so that we would be saved from it. So God's, this blessed life, this life of blessing from God, it's a life of walking by faith. It's a life that comes as a gift of God's grace. But this third truth that we need to see here is this. God's blessing does not mean the absence of trials. God's blessing does not mean the absence of trials. I think one of the main ways that we wrongly define the blessed life has to do with trials or the absence of trials. So often, church, we associate ease and comfort and the alleviation of trials to God's blessing. And we associate the presence of trials in our lives to a lack of God's blessing. In other words, we think that to be blessed means not experiencing any trials or any hardships or any difficulties or any discomfort in life. And when we go through a trial, we think that the end of the trial is when God has blessed us, but not while we're in the trials. We think that God's blessing means no trials or the end of a trial. But what we see in this passage and throughout the rest of God's word is that That thinking gets exposed by God's word as wrong, untrue, false thinking. Our definition of the blessed life being an absence of trials is actually the opposite of how God defines the blessed life. From verse 12 through the end of the passage, we see Isaac being blessed by God and at the same time experiencing various trials. Look at verses 12 through 14. They tell us that God blessed Isaac with a huge crop that he became rich, that he became very wealthy, and that he had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants. But guess what follows right on the heels of God's blessing in that sense? A trial. The Philistines become envious of him and all the wealth that he is gaining, and Abimelech kicks Isaac out of the land. Isaac had trusted the Lord by staying in Gerar, and God had blessed him there, but now he is getting kicked out of what has become his home. The text told us that he stayed there a long time. This has become his home, and now he's being kicked out of his home. It's a trial, but that's not all. Look at verse 17. It tells us that Isaac peacefully obliged. He packed up. He moved a little bit further away. He moved to the valley of Gerar, and he settled there. Verse 18 tells us that he dug the wells of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham's death. I will pause once more and say one thing that we see about the wells here, and there's a lot of wells. Actually, my daughter was telling me earlier that uh, she had she she was asking, "What are we going? What are you going to preach on today?" I said, "What chapter in Genesis?" And I said, "26." And it's it's about Isaac, and he's and he's with the with Abimelech, and lies about. It. She was like, "Oh yeah, that's the one that has lots of wells." She was like, "It's a lot of wells." And she said, "I can't remember all their names." I said, "I can't either." Um, but yeah, lots of wells here. What is that supposed to do? Well, it's again making a connection to Abraham. A lot of what's happening in Genesis 26 is showing us that there's this connection with his father and the the promises are being passed from Abraham to Isaac. So all these wells connect Isaac back to his father Abraham. The promises are passing on. So Isaac digs wells, but then what happens next? The herdsmen of Gerar quarrel with Isaac's herdsmen over the well. 
They quarrel over one well, so Isaac's men dig another one. They quarrel over that one, he has to dig another one. Listen, that's a trial. If I have to dig a well, I only want to dig one, right? I don't have to dig another one, and then another one, and another one. It's a trial. He digs a third. They don't quarrel over it, and then we learn that Isaac moves from there to Beersheba. Now, if we've been tempted to think that these trials mean God has no longer blessing Isaac, look at verses 23 through 25. God repeats the promises. He renews the covenant promises with Isaac in verses 23 through 25. Isaac worships the Lord then by building an altar as his father had done. So maybe that means all the trials are over, right? Wrong. In verse 26, Isaac gets a visitor. Visitors can be good or they can be not good. Depends on who the visitor is, right? (laughs) Some visitors make your heart glad when you see them at the door. Others make you want to hide. You say, oh no, not today. Well, Isaac probably thinks he's moved on from there. Abimelech kicked him out of the land. He moved, uh, moved away, moved to Beersheba. And, and, and he's probably thinking he's never going to have to see Abimelech again. But guess who's knocking on his door? Abimelech. Abimelech. And he has brought a couple of his top guys with him. So it looks like nah, this might not, be, that might not be a fun meeting that we're about to have. So Isaac, you know, Answers the door, welcomes him to his tent, wherever, wherever he's at, and, uh, and, and here's what happens. Verse 27, Isaac says to them, why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? We, we know that Isaac's not happy to see Abimelech standing there. I think it's safe to say that Isaac views these visitors as a trial. But Isaac hears them out, and look at verses 26 through 31. We see that they have witnessed, they express to Isaac, we've witnessed how the Lord has blessed you. And we want to make a peace treaty with you. You're getting stronger and stronger, and we want to not go to war with you. We want to be at peace. And so they make a peace treaty. Isaac agrees to it. They eat a meal, exchange oaths, and Isaac sends them on their way. What's happened through all of that? We see blessing mixed with trial, blessing and trial happening at the same time. And brothers and sisters, I think one of the things that we must notice in this passage is that the blessed life is not a life where trials are absent. Mixed in with all the statements and evidence of God's blessing in Isaac's life are various trials. He gets kicked out of his home. The people around him envy him and hate him and fight with him. They contend over the wells. That means fight. Then when he moves away from them, they show back up. The trials follow him. They show back up on his doorstep. Now if you say, well, if Isaac had never gone to Gerar in the first place, none of these trials would have happened. But friend, who told Isaac to settle in Gerar? God did. As God leads Isaac into a blessed life, he at the same time leads Isaac into trials. Friend, just because you're walking through a trial does not mean that you have stepped out from underneath God's blessing. Yes, some of the trials in our lives are a result of our sin, and we have to face and live the consequences of those things. But not every trial. So don't think that just because perhaps you're walking through a trial that that you have stepped out from underneath God's blessing, that he no longer cares about you, that he no longer loves you. God's blessing very often comes to us through trials. We must be on guard against the wrong thinking that God's blessing means an absence of trials in our lives. Listen to the Apostle Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. It, it completely debunks any idea that, that if we're on God's good side, that that means there will be no trials in our lives. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. Now, he's just described the glorious gospel of Jesus and the blessing of eternal salvation that we have in Christ and then Peter says this in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials he's talking to Christians he's talking to people who have been who have believed in Jesus who have been saved who are living a blessed life because they are in Christ he says if necessary you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
What in the world did Peter just say? He said that not only will we experience trials as believers in Christ, those trials are a necessary part of God's good work in our lives so that our faith is refined to the glory and praise of God. God doesn't promise Isaac a trial-free life, but he does promise Isaac here in this passage that he will be with him through the trials of life. Listen, the blessed life will not be absence of trials, but it's just as true that God will not be absent from us, church, as we face those trials. Two times in Genesis chapter 26, God promises to be with Isaac. He doesn't promise him a trial-free life, but he does promise to be with him. Look at chapter 26, verse 3. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. Chapter 26, verse 24. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you. Church, far better Far better from a life that is free from trials. Far better from a life where trials are not present is having the presence of God with us as we walk through those trials. Because what happens as we walk through those trials with the Lord is we learn to trust Him more. And we learn to depend upon Him more. And that is the best thing for you and for me. It's dangerous when we live relying upon ourselves. It's a beautiful and gracious and good thing when we live depending upon the Lord. And the trials in our lives help us learn to do that better and better and better. That's the blessed life. So God's blessing leads us to walk by faith in God's promises. God's blessing is an act of grace. God's blessing does not mean the absence of trials. It does mean, though, that God's going to be with us as we walk through those trials. But let me share with you this fourth and final point. Truth number four is this. God's blessing provides what is needed to accomplish his salvation plan. Don't miss this part. God's blessing provides what is needed to accomplish his salvation plan. Now, despite Isaac's sin and despite the trials he faced throughout this passage, we see God constantly providing exactly what Isaac needed. He needed a land to dwell in to survive the famine. God provided it. He needed God's grace to cover his faulty faith. God provided it. He needed water to survive. Guess what? God provided it. Verse 22 and verse 32, we see that God provided wells that produced water and that nobody fought him for. God blessed Isaac by providing not everything that Isaac may have wanted, but everything that was needed to accomplish his plan for Isaac's life. I was walking through a parking lot um, just the other day, and I heard, overheard a, a man saying, uh, saying, man, I, that's the kind of car I want right there. That's the kind of car I want. And um, this little kid, I don't know if it was, it was his kid or somebody else's kid, uh, said, <laughs> said, is that a want or a need? <laughs> he said, that's my car right there. It was going, that's my car. And, and I heard the little kid go, is that a want or a need? I was like, somebody's been teaching, <laughs> teaching him that not everything is a need that, that he's been wanting. He probably heard that in the line at the grocery store, right? That's not a need. That's a want. Um, and so he, he called that guy out. And, and he was honest. He said, that's a want. It's a want. He said, it's not a need. God doesn't always provide everything we want, but God does provide everything we need. And he provides what we need to accomplish his plan of salvation. This is where we always have to step back in Scripture. We want to dive into the details, but we always want to interpret Scripture in light of the whole storyline of God's Word. Over and over in this passage, we see God promise Isaac an offspring. We see the word bless repeated a lot. We also see the word offspring repeated a lot. That word offspring ought to make a little alarm go off in our minds. And it should take us back not only to God's promise to Abraham, Isaac's father, to give him an offspring, but all the way back to God's promise to Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, where God promised, guess what? An offspring. He promised an offspring. God promised to send a man born of woman who would defeat the serpent. God promised a deliverer. God promised salvation. Listen, God's promises to Isaac here in chapter 26 are all about that promised deliverer. God's provision in Isaac's life 
The blessed life as God provides what he needs when he needs it are not just about Isaac. It's about God's promised deliverer. Isaac needed food to survive the famine. Why? Not just so that he could live, but so that the promised offspring could come. Isaac needed God's grace to sustain those promises. Not just for Isaac, but so that the promised offspring could come. Isaac needed God to provide water so that he and later his family could live and thrive. And as verse 22 says, be fruitful. Why? Not just for him and his immediate family, but so that the promised offspring could come. And church, eventually, God's promised offspring did come from the Abraham and Isaac family tree. Many, many years later, the angel told a man named Joseph, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from from their sin. Church, that is the promised deliverer. What we see in Genesis 26 is God working out his plan of redemption, his salvation plan, which centers upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we learn here as we step back and we interpret this passage in light of the rest of God's word is that the blessed life is one where we experience God providing not just what we need to survive in the here and now, but God providing what is needed to accomplish his salvation plan. Now, for Isaac, it was the grace and provision so that his family could grow and one day produce the promised offspring. But for you and for me, the blessed life means God providing what we need so that we can hear about Jesus, so that we can believe in Jesus for salvation, and so that we can then go and tell others the good news about Jesus until all the nations are blessed through Jesus as God promised to Isaac here in chapter 26, verse 4. So that all the nations would be blessed through this promised offspring. Church, God's blessing provides what is needed to accomplish God's salvation plan. Brothers and sisters, once again, Our definition of the blessed life stands often in need of correction. Our idea of blessing often centers on us, our comfort, our ease, our wants. But the true blessed life is not ultimately about you. It's not ultimately about me. It's about God accomplishing his salvation plan through his son, Jesus Christ. God has accomplished part of this plan already. He's accomplished the sending of Jesus to pay the full price for our sins. Jesus came and he provided the grace that we need. He willingly died on the cross in our place, taking God's wrath that we deserve upon himself. And then he rose up from the grave so that now the purchase of our salvation is done. Jesus said, it is finished. God has provided that. I'll just pause there and say, have you believed in Jesus? God has done all the work. Have you trusted in Christ alone for salvation? If not, you must. It is our only hope of forgiveness of our sins and a relationship with God and eternity with Him and escape from divine punishment. God has accomplished the sending of Jesus to purchase our salvation, but church, God is still working to accomplish the rest of his salvation plan. And that plan includes you and me and everyone who has believed in Jesus for salvation. Say, what is that rest of that salvation plan? It's the gathering of the nations. It's the nations. It's your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, people here and people to the uttermost parts of the earth, hearing the good news of Jesus. And so, seek the blessed life. It's not wrong to seek the blessed life, church. Seek the blessed life, but understand what the blessed life is. It means walking by faith in a, in a sea of God's grace, enduring whatever trials come our way as we live our lives for the purpose of God accomplishing his work of salvation by spreading the gospel to the nations, knowing that God is going to be with us and is going to provide for us everything we need so that the nations would know that Jesus is king. That's the blessed life. 
Praise God that he graciously allows sinners to experience divine blessing. Not just one day when we're with him and then new heavens and the new earth, but even today, friend, even today, right now, God allows us to experience his divine blessing as we walk by faith, as we are grateful for his grace, living under his grace, as we see his trials as a part of his gracious work in our lives, and as we go accomplishing his salvation plan. Church, let's live God's blessed life for us. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the way that you love us. We thank you so much for the way that you have provided for our salvation. Thank you that we get to live the blessed life. But God, we just want to stop as we have looked at your word and ask you to forgive us. For often wanting your blessing, but wanting to define what that blessing is and what it looks like in our lives. God, we need you to correct our thinking if perhaps our thinking has strayed from your word. So God, would you give us grace and do that? Would you help us to consider what it actually means to live the blessed life? And ultimately, Lord, we see it's not about ourselves. It's about you, it's about your son Jesus, and it's about your plan of salvation, which by your grace we get to be included in, but so do the nations, everyone who believes in Jesus. So help us to participate in what you are doing, knowing that you are with us always to the very end of the age. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, we're going to respond in song. And so as we sing, you consider the truths of, from God's word that we have talked about today. Maybe you want to take a moment and just pray. Ask, ask the Lord to help you put these truths into practice. Maybe confess some sin to him that he's convicted you of today. Maybe you want to lift your voice and you want to praise the God who is so gracious to us. Let's respond in obedience. Would you stand and let's sing together.
has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be Heavenly Father, as we go from this place, may that be our anthem. Lord, that our chains have been broken, they are gone because of your amazing grace, and we are therefore freed up not to live our lives for ourselves or for our own glory, but to live it for you, singing praises to your name, rejoicing in the truth that you have sent your Son to break the power of of this sin that has been canceled in our lives so that we can not only be saved and have our sins forgiven, but so that we can spread through all the earth abroad, as we just sang, the honors of Thy name. And Father, we will say glory to You and praise and love be ever, ever given by saints below and saints above the church in earth and heaven. Lord, that is our prayer. May we serve you faithfully this week. Give us many opportunities to tell others the good news of Jesus and help us to tell them. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.